welcome to Thursday on the um, Integrated Care Northamptonshire Virtual Wellbeing Festival. Really pleased to um, be able to introduce Rob today, who is going to be taking us through humour in health and care. We've already had about half an hour of it, so we're all ready. Um, as I said, the session will start short, shortly. Um, it does say there that your cameras and mics are disabled at this time. Please, if you can, if you're brave enough, turn your cameras on so that we can see you um, and see your reactions throughout the session. That would be fantastic. Now, the team today, myself, Dawn, I'm just introducing the session and closing the session. And we've got Anne in the background who's going to be monitoring the chat box. So please get your questions, comments, gifts, whatever it is you want in the chat box throughout the session for Rob. Now, the um, session today will be recorded. It can be found on the festival website. So if you do miss any parts of it, you can go back and watch it. Um, if you want to ask any questions throughout the session, please feel free to raise your hand using the electronic hand. Um, and you can also, as I've said, post your questions into the chat box. For those that are hard of hearing, if you use the three dots at the top of your screen, you can select transcript if that will help you. And without further ado, really chuffed and already finding you very humorous to be able to pass over to Rob for Humour in Health and Care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm just to say thank you to D Dawn and Louise and Anne for, for having me and asking me to, to do this. Uh, my name's Rob. Hello. Um, it's uh, so uh, as usual with these things. I've planned a whole list of things to talk about, which which, which I have on me. Um, me being me, the chances are I'll, I'll probably ignore the list quite early on, and we'll go all over the place. So so please do feel free to interrupt with any questions, and we'll build building a bit of time for a Q and A at the end as well. Um, so the the session uh, that we've got together over the next hour. Uh, is humour in health and care in brackets comedy poetry so we've, we've covered pretty much a lot of things humour health care and, and poetry and comedy as well um so i'll tell you a bit about my background and then i'll i'll let you know what the hour is going to look like so uh my name's rob um i was a mental health nurse for uh, about 16 years all told uh, i worked mainly in adult mental health what they used to call acute psychiatry uh, as well as psychiatric intensive care and for the most part i worked in leicester but i also lived and worked in melbourne in australia for a year in early psychosis intervention and also i worked in edinburgh uh, for a year as well um and, and i've worked all over the place so um so i've been around the clinical block a bit and then i left nursing uh, quite a few years ago, uh, over a decade ago, to become a singing double act as half of the comedy, uh, half of a double act doing the comedy clubs. Uh, really filthy songs. It was very much the lower end of the comedy club spectrum. We won't dwell on this uh, over, uh, overly, but uh, that was how I left nursing, was became a comedian for, for five or six years. And now I do what can best be described as stand-up poetry. Um, if you've not heard of stand-up poetry, don't worry about it. It's it's a bit niche. It's, it's sort of like stand-up comedy, but it rhymes and there's no jokes in it. Uh, and I do that. And I've got, you know, before COVID, had the loveliest job in the world, right? I've, I've toured the planet performing my witty poems to uh, audiences of people. And, and it, yeah, the year before COVID, I was performing in Mexico, New Zealand, Canada, all over the place. Um, then, then the pandemic happened and my diary became emptier than Richard Branson's soul. And uh, uh, I went back to nursing for a period of time. And that was, that was the first time in my life or career I'd ever worn a new nursing tunic because we never used to wear uniforms in mental health, you know. So, so, you know, two years ago, I'm in a tunic for the first time, which was a shock. It didn't make me look like a nurse, let me tell you. It, so it, it looked like I'd nicked it. it. It was more like Gollum trying to sell a raspberry ripple than anything uh, remotely therapeutic. Uh, this is an issue. Um, and so in terms of the things that we'll be covering today, um, it's really, there's, there's going to be, I've, I've split up the talk into four themes, really. There's, we're going to talk about laughter as a clinician, about as a, someone who works in health or social care and how, how laughter and humour can be used and some of the pitfalls and, and strategies around it. We'll be talking about um, the Comedy Asylum. I'm lead artist for an organisation called the Comedy Asylum, uh, which is basically me and uh, uh, a gang of people, many of, all of whom are on the receiving end of 
mental health treatments and many of whom have got a label of quote unquote severe and enduring mental health problems and we put on comedy shows what's not to like we'll be talking about that um also i'm one of the few people who actually goes into inpatient mental health settings and leads workshops in comedy and improvisation and and things like that we'll talk about that um, and then we'll also talk about how humor can be used for staff well-being as well and for public health education and work with kids so i'm going to try and get all that in if uh, you know, if, if, if possible. Um, and there's other bits and pieces that we do around the place. I've got um, I've got a show that's, uh, um, it's a whodunit set on an Alzheimer's ward. I play, play 15 characters. I'm not going to do it now, it's too long a show. Um, but basically it's like Cluedo meets Memento, if that makes any sense. And we've been using that, several NHS trusts, we've been using that as part of the freedom to speak up agenda to train healthcare staff in reporting concerns. You know, what we used to call whistleblowing, we don't call it that anymore. Um, and that's been really interesting as well. And I also, I'm nearly done, I also lead uh, uh, a six week closed group in mental health recovery colleges uh, with quite a wordy title, The Value of Comedy in Recovery from Mental Distress. So there's a lot of um, humour, comedy, social and healthcare going on with me. So um, what you're going to hear over the next hour is by no means an exhaustive overview of, of humorous interventions in health and social care. It's, it's more about, it's really my experiences of doing it for the last 30 years or whatever, and, and some of the, the lessons I've learned along the way and some of the, the things that I've found really helpful in in doing it and um, also just just in case it gets dull at any point we're also going to introduce intersperse it with what we call the poetry tapas so uh, in your chat bar right now um i'm just going to put that right so you will see a list of um varyingly dubious poetry titles in your chat bar uh, and the way this works this the poetry tapas works perfectly well as a live thing but it also works on teams as well um in that, um, you, the people watching and listening, will choose whatever of those titles you want to hear. And I do the poem. Um, it's as simple as that. There's, um, I do reserve the right to uh, decide, you know, to pull a poem out that I decide to do, because sometimes I do. Um, but generally, they're the titles you've got to choose from. I'm going to give you a little poem before we crack on properly. Um, I'm going to, uh, and then, and then you, can, you can peruse those over the course of the next bit. Um, I'll start with the top one on the list, uh, makes sense. Um, out of all the poems, th these are all vaguely mental health related uh, poems that you've got there. Um, probably the least related mental health one is the top one, which I'm going to do for you now, I think. My daughter is a Donington goth. Um, I think in my head, I was selecting mental health poetry and in my head I went mental health, depression, misery, goth, I think. I think that's why that poem is in there. Uh, so um, I was I was writer in residence in Castle Donington, Live the Dream, and I'm in Castle Donington, and I don't know how well you know Castle Donington, but just in case you don't, tiny little town, but it's really easy to leave. Every, everyone who lives in Castle Donington says, yeah, it's great here, it's really easy to leave. Uh, they've got the racetrack, they've got the airport, they've got the metal festival. Anyway, this is the first poem for you. My daughter is a Donington goth. And it's because I was chatting with a bloke at Donington Library whose daughter had just become a goth. Um, and it's clear they've not ruled out that stray goth gene uh, over the years. Uh, so this is for him, it goes like this. I married a girl from Castle Donington and together we had a baby. I spent the first 12 years thinking she was a beautiful miniature lady. Oh, by the way, I've broken out the poem in case you're judging me on rhyme and meter. Uh, what you need to know is that The Cure and Bauhaus are two dodgy goth bands from the 80s, all right? And, and then just after she hit 13, the eyes got dark and the look got mean. She resembled Tim Burton's wildest fears. She avoided daylight for the next six years. My daughter is a Donington goth. Her mum likes to cure. It must have rubbed off. She says that she's happy just being herself, but she's not raised a smile since 2012. She says Castle Donington is her least favourite place. It's the detectors in the airport and the metal in her face. I don't know how she eats with that bolt through her cheek. 
She's been stuck to the door of the fridge for a week. My daughter is a Donington goth. She's drawn away from the light to like a survivalist moth. She has a boyfriend who avoids the shower and listening to Bauhaus all day would make anyone dour. My poor sweet daughter, I hope it's a phase that one day she'll look back and laugh and it won't crack her face. And if she's like this forever, it could always be worse. Her brother watches X Factor and loves Oli Murs. There you go. Uh, so that's uh, that's my poem, yeah. Um, and, and of course, the nice thing about Teams and Zooms and all, you don't have to applaud, we just, just do it. Um, yeah, so <laughs> welcome to my world. Uh, so, so that's the kind of thing I do. Um, so um, I got nursing and poetry and comedy have always have always sort of coexisted with me since I was a teenager. Um, I got into mental health nursing at the age of 17. Uh, so about five years ago, uh, because because I got paid for going to sleep. That was how I got into it. And I think most of us who work in health and social care, people always ask how they got, you know, what made you want to do it? And for me, I got paid for sleeping. I was 17 and I thought this is my perfect job. And it was a job working sleepover shifts in this dodgy uh, private psychiatric home. And it was actually a really lovely place. It was They were really nice to the people there. It was, it was, it was a very compassionate place. But dodgy, by which I mean I was there all night. I just turned 18. I'm there all night on my own, uh, uh, giving out medication, no supervision, nothing like that. And uh, and I get paid cash in the morning and go about my day, you see. And and it was an education for me because the, the guys who lived in this place were, were, were 10 men. And this would be in 1990 when they were closing all the psychiatric institutions. And these are all guys that had been in the, the institutions for decades at a time. And they suddenly found themselves kicked out of these institutions and expected just to get on with it. And they were in this care home. And and it was great. As, a, as 18 year old me, I didn't think I didn't realise then how much they took me under their wing. But every night we'd stay up and we'd smoke cigarettes and drink coffee. And there was always an unlimited supply of trifle. So we'd eat trifle all night and watch telly. And then and then someone told me that was called nursing. And I thought I can see a future in this. So I did that. And then um, at the same time, I was I got into punk rock as a teenager, saved my life. Um, and 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 I got into poetry and comedy through the unlikely route of punk rock. The, I'll eventually document that in novel form. Um, but as a teenager, I was in punk rock bands and the chat between the songs was getting longer and longer and longer. So eventually I just started doing it without the band and that was how the, the poetry and comedy happened really. And so the two have always happened. And so in my, my, my in all the years I spent working full time as a nurse in adult mental health, I was running poetry gigs and I was going around the country doing poetry gigs and, and, and comedy gigs as well. And it's, it's the nice thing about doing nursing shifts is you, you can do that because it's not a regular nine to five job. And so throughout my, my whole career, whenever I've been a nurse, I've also done comedy and poetry. Whenever I've done comedy poetry, there's also been an element of nursing there. So even as a full time nurse, you will have patients that regularly write poetry, that like doing that kind of stuff, um, and will show you their poems. Because where I live in Leicester, it's not a massive city, so it, would be, it wouldn't be unusual to get patients turning up to gigs and stuff like that, which I never had a problem with, because I think, you know, everyone else has got as much right as anyone else to spend ticket on the... Uh, on, on you know on, on seeing a gig um uh i've i've had um i, I once accidentally did in, a gig in derby uh, with a fellow performer who i went to derby with him went and we did the gig and it's great and i only found out afterwards that he was an inpatient who'd gone awol from the ward next door to do the gig uh, and that was a bit tricky um but but the, these are uh, these things have always sort of crossed over in, in quite a i remember doing a night shift and uh, a patient coming, you know, via the police in handcuffs, and she was saying, "Hey, you're that funny bloke, aren't you?" You know, and I'm in charge of the ward at that point. So, um, and so for me, why do boundaries have to be clear? I've always been quite comfortable being a nurse who does comedy, or or, or, or a poet who does nursing, or or or, or whatever it is. Um, the uh, the um, really nice. Uh, thing I think about laughter in mental health generally, and I think I learned this from my clinical time, um, was when I was working as a nurse, which was a very long time ago, 
Um, back then, on, on the adult mental health units, the patients would have their own smoke room. Um, I'm not about to advocate the return to smoking for NHS Trust, by the way, in case you're wondering. I'm not going to go down that road. But the patient's smoke room was great. It was, the, it was the nucleus of the subculture, of the patient's subculture, within, it, within any psychiatric unit. And it was the only room in which the patients were more powerful than the staff. And although I am glad that we're not smoking in hospitals anymore, I really can't help, I really miss the days of the patient's smoke room. Because what would happen is, say for on a late shift or whatever, you'd go in and get a handover, and then you'd go into the patient's smoke room and get a proper handover, um, and it would be it would be party to some of the most sublime conversations and some of the best laughs I've ever had. Um, and I discovered that humour has an essential ward, uh, a central role in any mental health ward or anyone's mental health journey of recovery, really. Um, in the humour is a great way of diffusing tension um, because that all that is why we laugh biologically. It's a release of tension, and so humour is a great way of releasing tension, as we know. It's 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 a fantastic way of actually transcending your nurse patient roles or your your therapist patient roles or your your, your social worker client roles. It's whatever roles you've got, you can actually transcend them using humour, and it allows you just to relate to each other as as, as equal human beings, which which I think is actually really good for both parties, um, and it's also Humor is also a really great way, I think, of putting seemingly insurmountable problems into context. And what what I learned very quickly as a nurse in mental health is that humor is a huge tool in your in your armory. And like any tool, it can be. Um, and I think this is the reason a lot of schools are, are, are scared of doing comedy with the kids. That humor, like any tool, you know, like a hammer, can be immensely creative or immensely destructive, depending on how you use it. But I think if you use it in the right way in, in any kind of care setting or any kind of social care or mental health setting, it allows the people you're working with to see the real you. I think we, we are our most natural versions of ourselves when we're making a whimsy or a joke. And, and I'm also a massive fan of the whimsy. That You know, a joke, you know, the, the whimsy doesn't have to be hilarious. It's just a silly thing to say for its own sake. And I think that's great. I think that's really good for us as well. Um, and the it, what, and what it does when we use humour, it demonstrates to each other that, yeah, we're actually just as idiosyncratic, you know. And, that, and I do believe quite strongly that we all have our unique and beautiful ways of being ridiculous, whether we have a, a psychiatric condition or not. Um, and so humour is a great way of sort of displaying our little idiosyncrasies to the whole, you know. It's it's one thing, we were talking about um, North America just before we started. I was saying, it's, it's one crying shame, I don't quite do whimsy in the same way as North America. A joke has to be funny or not. And there's no room for whimsy, which, which is a shame. Um, I, was, I was in Canada last week and an ambulance went past, you know, the lights, and I, I made the old um, Eric Morecambe joke about, oh, he's, he's not going to sell many ice creams going at that speed. And, and my American friend looks at me and goes, it's an ambulance. And it's like, I, I hate you. You know, anyway, um, so uh, I'm just moving on to the, the next thing on my list. Um, is the, the the other nice thing about it is that it shows up absurdity. So if you, and, and often humour is about just reflecting our own absurdities back at us. And there are a few areas more absurd than 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 the psychiatric system. And so if if you want to find humour in everyday day-to-day -day absurdity, you don't have to look much further than the average mental health ward. Um, you, you know, the, and, and it's just day-to-day -day things, you know, like someone waking you up to give you sleeping tablets, you know, things like the, uh, the, um, the, the, I went back to eating disorders uh, during the pandemic and uh, on the unit, they've got a, a list of all these therapy groups you could do. They've got loads of groups, really, you know, really interesting comprehensive list of therapy groups. Next to the self-esteem group, it goes in brackets, invitation only and i'm thinking is it just me that finds that funny you know can i come to the self-esteem group no uh, you know and, and so it and, and so often i think whether you're a patient on a ward or a clinician or a doctor is these things are absurd and then the other great thing about laughter um, particularly on any kind of inpatient unit, it's a great way of fighting back. It's a really great way of fighting back. I'm thinking at the moment of the patient who dressed up as his own psychiatrist at, at Halloween um, and, and things like that. You, you know, it's just such a lovely way of, of, of sort of 
asserting yourself in a way. Um, I think we're about ready for a quick poetry tapas, um, and then we'll uh, and then we'll we'll, we'll we'll do the next thing from there. Um, I'll I'll give you a, a quick poem before we go into the tapas bit uh, about which demonstrates I think the the I've got a love of pranks as well. Um, this poem goes: the Greek student nurse who I sent to pharmacy for some fallopian tubes has yet to forgive me. But the patients were amused, so at least I did it therapeutically. There you go. Not a long poem. Um, right, so um, I'm just going to, uh, oh, have a look. Right, so uh, this is, I'll just have a look at the trap bar. Oh uh, yeah, I remember as a student, this is from Katie. I remember as a student nurse being told to wake up a patient to offer PRM pain release. Isn't it ridiculous, Katie? Uh, my, as a student nurse, my first week, I got sent, the nurse went, go and get so-and-so's TTOs. I go, okay, and like, what are TTOs? I'm having a right old panic. Like, to take out. Like, it's quicker to say leave meds than TTOs, but we've got we've got a, a habit. And it's not just nurses. We all, we all use initials where we don't have to. You know, it takes longer to say www dot than it does World Wide Web. I, I digress. Um, right, let's, uh, let's get uh, a poetry tapas in things. So... Uh, here is your menu again. Uh, we'll remove my daughter is a donning to goth. Now, you can either unmute yourself and shout, and it's the first person to shout, or it's the first person to type the, the, the name of the poem in the chat bar. It's as simple as that. Brilliant. Wayne wants a wee. Thank you, Amy. Uh, excellent choice. So highly discerning. I'm the COPD sing-along. Right, we'll try and do both if we can. Uh, I was written, when I worked in a bank, I got sent to the station room to get a verbal agreement form. Oh, Anne. Oh, 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 mate, I'm sorry. At least it wasn't tartan paint. I mean, you know, it could, it could have been worse, couldn't it? Uh, right, so Wayne wants a wee. So one thing I'll do a lot, which we'll talk about in a minute, is the group poem. This is the way once we quite a nice segue actually, because it gets on, onto the the, 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 the clinical the, the, the creative side of things. And the group poem, the way it works is I'll turn up on an inpatient unit. I do it in prisons and schools and everywhere as well, but you know, this is a healthcare type social care type of presentation. So I'll turn up on a on a mental health unit with a flip chart and a sharpie, and I'm usually in the day room. And I'll write a poem in real time while everyone in the room shouts at me. And, and together we'll, we'll, we'll create a poem. And I love doing this because the poem is ultimately copyright no one, because no one person could have created it. I'm the scribe and I'm, I'm coming up with the rhymes and meter in real time as I write the poem. But the ideas are from everyone in the room. Um, it's a really great way of bringing staff and patients together as well. Because everyone, and, and also because you're writing about something quite often, sometimes you write about serious things, um, but usually we write about things that are totally ridiculous. A case in point being Wayne once a week. Um, so this was a group poem written on a unit for people with learning difficulties and mental health problems. Wayne, and it is his real name, is a staff member who kindly allowed us to use his real name, uh, who is an extremely excellent and highly dedicated occupational therapist and was very flattered to have a poem written about his bladder. Um, this is not a true story. Um, uh, uh, what you need to know is that Hugo is the name of the pet his therapy dog. Hugo is their pap dog, right? This is Wayne once a week, not a true story. It was after he put up the Christmas tree, he found himself feeling incredibly thirsty. So he had a massive cup of tea and then he had another followed by a crafty brandy. And then he had another and another. And then he ate jelly and trifle and washed it down with a sherry. And then he started to feel merry. Oh no, it wasn't merry. It was May we. It started with a slight discomfort and then it became a niggle. Right, this is a very mature poem uh, you've, uh, you, you, you've chosen by, by, by the way. Maybe. It started with a slight discomfort and then it became a niggle and then it started to hurt a bit and then he started to jiggle and then it became a trickle. He clenched himself up as best as he could. He crossed his legs, but he got himself into a bit of a pickle. He ran to the loo, but Matron stopped him to talk about nothing for a very long time. And then she moved on to the risk assessments and the dripping tap and the leaking plumbing. He he made his excuses and ran to the loo. It was then the door handle snapped in two. So he ran to the other one, but that was occupied. And it was at that point that something in his bladder gave up and died. He started to use the waste bin, but sadly it had holes in. So he looked at the cup, but it wasn't big enough. So he stood over the kitchen sink, 
But Matron came and stopped him. If you're doing anything even remotely dodgy, she always turns up. That was one of the staff members said that really. She always turns up when you're doing something dodgy. Uh, she always turns up. Eventually he gave up because he knew he couldn't win. And so he ran over to the Christmas tree that he decorated a few moments ago. He remembered it was Pat Dog Day, so he weed on the floor and blamed poor Hugo. The cleaner came along and mopped the whole lot up and told Hugo off for being a very naughty pup. There you go, that's uh, that's Wayne wants a wee written, uh, but that, that's come to you from a, a ward full of, of patients uh, with uh, a dual diagnosis of mental health problems and learning difficulties, and it's come to a ward of them via a conduit of me uh, for your your uh, your delectation and enjoyment. Uh, right, hey, uh, so um, next up, I wanted to talk to you about the comedy asylum. So I left nursing and started doing comedy full time. Uh, and I was keen on continuing to work in mental health as, as a comedian and as a poet because um, I'd worked in mental health all my life and I felt actually artistically I might be able to offer something more proactive than medicating and leaping on people, which is most of what I do in adult mental health. Um, I had a really lovely double epiphany when I started working creatively, doing what we call participatory arts as a as, as a comic poet in, in mental health settings and is I'd, I'd left I'd left nursing about a year earlier um I was doing the clubs and and I've been booked to do a series of creative writing workshops with mental health service users um uh in in, in the old catman catchment area covered by my old ward and so I went for a planning meeting it went really well and said yeah these people they're really looking to do it looking forward to doing the workshops for you it's a you know mental health community group and then she dropped this perler on me just before I left the room. She goes, oh yeah, there's a few of them that you used to nurse back in the day. Apparently, they're really looking forward to meeting you. And I thought, oh, I wonder who these people are. And, and I turned up, and, and they, this was my really, really nice two epiphanies back to back. Um, the patients I used to work with during the day, they were waiting for me, and it was great. I was really pleased to see them because um, the, the, all three of them had given me a proper run for my money back in the day. But we've got a lot of history and it's just really, really nice to see them again. But it's one um, person in particular who I nursed for many years on and off. Um, uh, and, and she arrived late uh, for this creative writing session. And it was horrible weather outside. It was, it was winter, it was storm, it was really awful. She arrives late and she walks into the room and she's got this face like thunder. And it's a face that I... I don't think it's over much to use the word triggering. In that, I felt I, I recognised this face that the, the eyebrows would be angry, the brow would like double in size, and you knew at that point something really unpleasant was going to happen. And the first epiphany I had was all right, and I thought, well, actually, I am not here. I'm not responsible for your safety. I'm here as a writer. I'm here as a poet. I'm here as a, a comedian. I'm here to do creative writing. So. This is about me actually deprogramming myself because I used to see that expression and think about medication or seclusion or this, that or the other. And actually, I don't have to think about anything like that. All I'm thinking about is helping you write. Right. So that was the first epiphany that I'm here creatively. The second epiphany was so much better. And it was this is that she obviously felt crap. Right. Hence the look on her face. She obviously felt angry, really upset. But that obviously wasn't about me wasn't all about me you know she'd come to do my workshop and I realized and it was an utterly be beautiful moment I realized that in spite of the fact she felt awful she crowbarred her carcass all the way across town in a storm in the most horrible weather ever she got late she's in a really bad mood and she'd done all that just to do creative writing with yours truly and I thought actually it doesn't get better than that and so I resolved there and then in that moment to give the best session that you, she could possibly have and it was great we wrote uh, I, 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 as far as I remember I think we she wrote a song about a perfect man um, to the tune of Robbie Williams' uh, Angels. And I can't remember it. I, I remember one rhyming couplet in it, which was, uh, he smothers me with affection. He licks the gaps between my toes, even when I have a fungal infection. So as you can see, taste is a large part of what I do. Um, but it was great because the whole room of people sort of howling with laughter at the stuff she was writing. And, and I realised that in all those years I'd known her, we'd never laughed like that. Not even in the smoke room had we laughed like that. Um, and, and, and that sort of vindicated it really. And so if, if you're arguing to say, can any of you sort of watch listening to this, you do work in the field of health or social care. 
and you are wondering about you know the importance of those sort of creative interventions of just getting people to write or say something funny or just just come out with a line that's going to make the room laugh and um, it really is worthwhile because for me it's so much more proactive and we're going to cover in a minute about how we can use this to help reduce social isolation uh, which actually brings me to the comedy asylum so the comedy asylum is an organization it's run uh, by a group called Bright Sparks Arts in Mental Health. I'll just get the little website for you, actually, just in case it's uh, it's of use or no. Um, I'll just copy that right there and stick it in the old chat. So Bright Sparks Arts in Mental Health, that's them right there. They are an arts and health uh, organisation. They are a, a service user-led charitable incorporated organisation, the CEO, and they're supported by Leicestershire Partnership NHS Trust. Um, and the Comedy Asylum is one of theirs. And we've been going for 15 years. We've been doing it a long time now. And it came about because Leicester has a comedy festival, which always gets a disproportionate amount of, of people for a city the size of Leicester. And it was um, the fellow who is now uh, Leicestershire Partnership NHS's Arts and Health lead. He was 15 years ago a CPN working in assertive outreach. And quite a lot of his patients who'd got like long-term mental health problems a lot of them have got a label of severe and enduring mental health problems and he discovered that not only were the mental health problems ruining their lives but so was the social isolation that a lot of these people had a succession of losses where they'd lost a job they lost their mates they lost you, you, you know and and we, i'm not going to talk too much about how you know we know that socialized isolation makes relapse and readmission more likely right which you know it's not beyond the wit of man um and so they said quite a few of his clients were expressing an interest in having a go at comedy. And I was half of a double act doing the clubs at the time. And so he got me in to lead a bunch of two hour comedy workshops, um, and much of which was sketch comedy. And, and we did a show as part of the Leicester Comedy Festival and it sold out and we couldn't quite believe it. And a lot of the people in the audience were civilians as in you know they weren't involved in health or social care they weren't they weren't receiving any kind of mental health treatment they were there because it was in the brochure and so we also realized this is a great way of reducing stigma because because actually you've got people just going because it's a comedy gig and all right everyone on stage is is on the receiving end of mental health treatment but by the time they've made you laugh for an evening you've got a totally different perception of mental health and, and people mental health problems than what you might have had before um and and we just loved it to bits and we've done it every year since and we do a show at every comedy festival it always sells out and um, we do we've done uh, workshops in northampton and nottingham and uh, kettering as well uh, we go on to inpatient units which i'll talk about in a moment um and it's great and and there's something real and because it's comedy specifically comedy and it's people that have been on the receiving end of mental health treatment for years and years and years that are creating the comedy. There's something really empowering about it. And that is purely because of the humour. So what I mean by that is that when I remember when I was, you know, back in the day, this is we're talking sort of late 90s. I remember it was survivors poetry was the thing. And I used to, I went to quite a few survivors poetry gigs. And these these were people that as as far as I'm concerned have survived the mental health system, who wrote very serious poems about how vicious and unpleasant the mental health system had been to them. And and while a lot of the grievances were legitimate, I felt that at its worst, the whole survivor's poetry idea, all it was really was just perpetuating its own sense of victimhood because Although the grievances were legitimate and understandable, there was nothing beyond that, apart from, apart, apart from just this sort of how awful it had been. Um, with Comedy Asylum, they're making exactly the same points about the mental health system, but because they're having a laugh, because they're, they're having an absolutely belting time, there is something more empowering about it. So, for example, a typical Comedy Asylum sketch might be, yeah, one of the early ones was Dr Macbeth. And and the three witches are all pharmaceutical representatives, you, you, you know, and, and that's how it works. So you're, you're making all these points about the power of the pharma, pharmaceutical industry, but you're making jokes about uh, about how it's done. And and over the years, the comedy the, the comedy festival, the comedy asylum, is, is there's really there's, there's three aims that we've got with what we do. The first is confidence, skills, and well-being. 
right? We're using comedy or the, you know, people creating comedy to improve their confidence, skills and, and well-being. And that works on so many levels. There's the literary, literacy level because you're writing scripts, you, you, you're creating material. There's the confidence level because there is no feeling like making a room full of people convulsing mirth. I remember, I think it was the second year we did it, so, you know, she was riddled with anxiety. She was only on stage for 10 seconds because she just wanted to tell two jokes and what a 10 seconds it was. You know, and the next time she's on stage for 10 minutes and, and you know, and now he can't keep profit. So it's great for your confidence. The second is is using art to promote positive images of mental health and using comedy to promote positive images of mental health. Um, and the third is exclusive exclusivity and co-collaboration and social inclusion. Um, so we are aware that quite a lot of the people um, that do the comedy asylum, you know, we will be the only reason they leave the house for it one, once a week to come and do comedy with us. Um, you know, we, you know, we've we've had numerous people that were not doing anything, and then they started doing comedy asylum, and now they're going to college. There's a couple that are doing the comedy circuit professionally uh, now, um, and. Um, <laughs> The, 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 I, I want to, what I want to do is quickly is give you a little potted history of some of the comedy asylum sketches to let you know. And really it's on the, on the, the empowering fighting back tip. So uh, one of my favourite ones was one of our, uh, one of our participants lived in a, in a care facility. Uh, and it was very frustrating for her because she had a diagnosis of schizophrenia. She was, um, she was very, you know, very well functioning, but she lived in care and had a curfew which for someone in her 50s, she found very frustrating to have to be home at nine o'clock or whatever, because whenever we put on a gig, she had to leave halfway through and things like that. And then and then one day, she's left a care home now, she lives in, uh, in independent living, but she wrote this magnificent audience participation sketch, which was care home or brothel. So basically, she walk out with a clipboard and read out a load of statements, all of which she composed herself. And the audience have to guess whether it's a care home or a brothel that she's referring to. And of course, this is somebody who's lived in a care home for 10 years. And so it's like, uh, well, every week a retired colonel is richly humiliated by someone wearing a nurse's uniform. Care home or brothel, and and that's how it works. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, people greet each other by saying "hello, sailor." Right, you you get the gist, don't you? you know, the use of mechanical restraint is usually forbidden. Care home or brothel, and 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 so the audience are constantly. So my favourite, it's slightly surreal, was Thursdays is toad in the hole. Care home or brothel, right? So 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 it was just great, right? So um, we uh, and then the um, in our local um, unit, our local adult mental health unit. This is going back quite a few years now, but it was a it was a very sad time. We had a spate of very uh, of suicides, which were which are very well publicised, and it was a really horrible climate um, for for people to be working in the, uh, at the time. I'd left nursing by then, but I heard about it, and I knew I knew one of the patients, and it was a really sad time. As a knee jerk reaction, the trust in question um, removed toilet doors from quite a lot of the bed areas in the unit. Uh, you know, because there's nothing better for your mental health than someone watching you have a dump. Um, so they, you know, they moved quite a lot of the toilet doors from the unit. And um, and again, in the patient subculture, a lot of people really upset about this for, for reasons you can understand. Comedy asylum excelled themselves. They do a sketch that comedy festival, which is a couple of managers uh, from a mental health unit banning everything because everything could be dangerous so they ban paper they ban pens they ban clothing they ban talking they ban self-esteem and then they do a song and dance routine to um a police song every little thing's potentially tragic and and so again it's going back to that thing that you're making really serious points but you're using humor to do it and because quite a lot of my shows are about mental health, the question I get asked most often in, in interviews, how can you write comedy about mental health? And I think the question is, how can we use humour as people who work in mental health? And, and I think it's the easiest thing in the world, because I think the main thing, if, if your heart is in a good place, none of the jokes you're going to come out with are going to be are going to be wrong. Like some of those comedy asylum jokes, there's various levels of taste going on, but but it's quite obvious where all of them 
uh, are coming through. And um, I believe it's a, it's part of human nature. It's very good for us as people to have a voice and for our voice to be heard. And I think when you are on the receiving end of long term mental health treatment, that voice can often be not heard and often be forgotten. And so when you're using comedy and humour to put those points across, I think that that voice can be heard more powerful than ever. So we've done loads of sketches over the years. Uh, we've done um, Cannibal Come Dine With Me springs to mind. We've done COVID Love Island, uh, where Katie Hopkins is infected with COVID and dropped on the island and everyone spends the rest of the episode trying to avoid it. Um, we've, uh, you know, we've done a whole, we've done a whole load of sketches. We've, we've done, um, we did a great one uh, the, the, the year just gone called Mastermind. One of our participants um, is blind and, uh, and, and also has got um, memory impairment. Uh, and but she really wanted to write and be in a sketch, but she couldn't read a script and she struggled to learn the words. And so she wrote this brilliant sketch, which was Mastermind. And basically she sits there and every answer is pass. You know, so what is the name of the historic trade route between Afghanistan and Pakistan? Is the Khyber what? Pass, you know. Traditionally, how does one move the duchy to the left-hand side? That right, all that right. So, so she scores sort of twenty out of twenty on Mastermind, you know, and and, and she wrote that sketch, um, and and that really is comedy asylum in a nutshell. Um, we've got we got funding from the National Lottery, and since then we started going into inpatient uh, mental health settings. We've been doing this for quite a few years now, mainly in Northampton and Kettering and Leicester, uh, but also in Nottingham a little bit as well, and. There is no kind of setting we don't do. So it can be a dementia setting, it could be forensics, it could be psychiatric intensive care, it could be people learning difficulties, it could be adult with mental health. Um, you know, we'll do anywhere um, where, where there's a, a room of people, you know, where that's an inpatient setting, basically. And the workshops that we do are a bespoke combination of comedy, improvisation, um, creative writing and poetry. So it's a mix depending on what participants like to do. The two things that we've discovered work really well are low key improvisation games. Obviously, don't call it improvisation. That's just going to put people off, right? But but low key improv games do really, really well. Um, and I think there's just something about sitting in a circle and making up a silly story, say using three words each or whatever. Um, I think it's really good for your anxiety because it just gives people a chance to step out of themselves and enter into a world that's totally make-believe, where you make up everything. And of course, the whole golden rule of improvisation is there's no wrong answer. So you never go, well, that's wrong, you know. Um, and so it also teaches people actually their opinions are important and that they're being heard. And and it's rarely that we don't do some sort of low-key improv session that doesn't have loads of laughter coming out of it. Um, and the other thing that works repeatedly well in the uh, inpatient side of things is the group poem, which I referred to earlier, which is how we wrote Wayne Once a Wee, where I've got the flip chart and I write the poem in real time. And again, this, um, again, I can think of loads of times where as an artist, it's been easier to bring a ward full of people together or raise the morale or atmosphere of a ward than I was ever, ever able to do as a nurse. I think one of the skills as a, as a mental health nurse, particularly in adult mental health, is often to see things before they happen, to head things off at the pass before they go pear-shaped. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons you are more likely to get assaulted, say, in a dementia setting is because there's no sort of building up of aggressive behaviour, there's no warning. But, but often in, in adult mental health, there is a warning, and so you head things off at the pass. But still, as an artist, you, you could be so much more proactive. So example um, is I turned up on an adult mental health unit quite recently to do uh, a group poem. So I've got the flip chart, I've got the marker. And the agreement is always that if the ward is too volatile, obviously I'll come back another day and there's no offence meant or taken. And the staff are going, ah, oh, Rob, the ward is a bit volatile. We don't know. It's going to be 50-50. So we decided to risk it. And I'm in, the, I'm in the day room. I've got the flip chart. It turned out that the reason that the ward was so volatile was that a patient had absconded and she'd absconded to go to the local shopping centre to get her nails done. And the police had come and got her when she was three and a half nails into the process. You know, she's like, oh, no, really? And of course, the old Bill aren't going to sit around waiting for the other six and a half nails. They've got, they've, come on, they've got stuff to do. So she's taken it really quite personally. You know? She's been sort of frog marked back to the unit with three and a half really great looking nails and six and a half rather shabby looking nails. She's in a really bad mood. Um, there's very much an us and them atmosphere on the ward 
you, you know, the, um, her anger is rubbing off onto her fellow patients and it is certainly volatile. I'm there with the flip chart and we're, we're chatting away. And I think as an artist, it, you do have an advantage of coming in as an artist, as an outsider. And of course, one of the pitfalls in that is you have to be really careful of splitting. You know, if patients going on, oh, no one understands me like you do and all the rest of it. So you do, but, but coming in as an outsider can be really advantageous. And it was in this case, so we're chatting and to this person with, with the three great nails. And it turned out in conversation that she actually found one of the coppers quite attractive. And so we decided to write a love poem just in case they ever meet again next time she goes AWOL and she can read out this love poem. Uh, to this policeman. And, and again, it wasn't the most tasteful, you know, uh, someone contributed the line, your truncheon is my luncheon. Uh, but I do remember at that moment in time that I, I looked around me and the ward, everyone on the ward was laughing. You know, you've got your bank nurses at the OBS desk, you've got your patients, you've got your nurses peripheral, you've got everyone was laughing. You know, it wasn't an appropriate moment, but in a funny way it was. Um, yeah, and, and, that, and that is how the... And, as far as I'm aware, we might be the only people in the country going into mental health inpatient settings and doing comedy. Um, and, and of course, the other pitfall is you don't want to be too much in touch with your inner red coat. You, you know, you, you know, because people are there with serious problems. So you don't want to be like, come on, everyone, cheer. Uh, you know, so it is that, it is that balance to get. Um, I am going to read you out a little quote uh, from a patient who gave from an inpatient um, workshop, which goes like this. I remember when you, because she went on to do comedy asylum afterwards. I remember when you came onto the ward I was in, I was completely psychotic and didn't know where it, whether it was real or not. What I do remember so vividly is you making me laugh so hard I felt alive for that moment in time. That very day, I was able to see what was real and actually made it out for an escorted walk. I found me again through laughter, and I just wanted to say a great big thank you. Um, and we, I'm, a, I'm aware we, you know, we, we've got 40 minutes left, and I'm allowing a bit of time here for Q and A as, as well. As always with these things, there's loads I've not covered. So um, I've not talked about uh, going into schools for the public on the public health tip, but we are doing comedy in schools as well, in particular. Uh, we're doing a thing called School of Comedy. And again, this is the comedy asylum on the auspice. So essentially it's mental health comedy workshops. So we do these in, in primary school settings and it's about resilience and, and mental health education, but we're doing it on the comedy tip. Again, we've discovered that sketch comedy is really great for nine, 10, 11 year olds because sketch comedy, you're making usually jokes about poo, um, but you've got your teamwork skills, you've got your literary skills, you've got your listening skills, you've got your cooperation skills. It's actually really good for you. And because you, you're performing, you're constant in the fight or flight response. So it's a chance to talk to kids about the fight flight mechanism and about, about resilience and things like that. So we've not spoken much about that. Um, we've not spoken much about the freedom to speak up training. Uh, there's, there, there's always those. But I think I think before we move on to the Q&A, um, let, let's, have, let's have another one from the poetry tapas just to... Uh, 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 just to, oh, I'll, put, I'll put the bright spot thing on again, bear with me a second. Here is your, your list of potential poems, um, right here. So, uh, there we are, look. and that's just going on there right now. Um, uh, bear with me. Uh, for some reason, my, you might have to scroll up and see the previous list. For some reason, my, it's not happening for me on my, um, oh, here we go, so I've got it. Uh, there we go. Uh, so, well, we've missed out Wayne wants to read. So, what? Any particular poem? Anyone you want to? Uh, uh, you fancy? I could do the COPD sing along, as suggested by Ruth. But whiskey and your tea. Go on, MC. It's a lovely choice. I was writing a residence on an elderly ward, uh, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and a part of what I used to do was paraphrase what people were saying to me in conversation and then feed it back to them in rhyming form. And yeah, it's, and this is just two old patients moaning, which I really enjoyed. Uh, Breakfast isn't what it used to be. We'd start the day with pork pie and a drop of whiskey in our tea. It would give your soul a glow and set you up for the day. Now it's just a bowl of cornflakes because they took the whiskey away. But again, it's a sad, sad, miserable bone. Um, but that has taken us to about 10 minutes before close of business. So um, uh, while I, I look through my edit list and see if there's anything essential I've missed out, does anyone have any questions? You can put them in the chat bar or you can raise your hand. Um, it, it's certainly up to you how you how you engaged with it. Um, any anything anyone wants to know? 
Um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, love, love that. Um, although I'm, I, I'm quite keen, and I, a couple of others are, to hear the COPD sing along as well. Yeah. Yeah. Without further ado, then, yeah. The, um, so this is a commission from uh, Leicester Clinical Commissioning Group, the CCG. Um, they they found out that uh, choral singing. Uh, so the brief was to write a comedy sing along about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, an ambitious subject for comedy. I'm, I'm sure you'd agree. Um, but you're dealing with a professional, and it's because the CCG were aware of the fact that um, singing is really good for COPD, and choral singing is particularly good because it gets you out of the house as well. So they wanted a comedy sing along that advertised choral singing for people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So in this brief, I took it away and I thought, oh, what should I do? And I decided I'd write it as a, a to the lyrics of Tom Jones's Delilah, because I thought there is no more a sing-along, a sing-along than Delilah. It's, all, it's almost pathologically impossible to not sing along to Delilah, uh, particularly if you've had a few lemonades. So uh, this, uh, this, so you're about to, Anne, you're about to find out why I'm a poet and not a singer, okay? This is not, yeah, I'm sort of glad I'm doing this at the end, because it's not going to be dignified for me, and so I apologise in advance for not being able to sing. Uh, but anyway, this is the ambitiously titled COPD sing-along. Quite ridiculous, it goes like this. I wake up my whole street with my cough in the morning, da da da. I have a hack like a cat who just swallowed a frog. I struggle breathing, but now that I'm singing, I'm finding the strength to go on. My, my, my Delilah, you help me respire. I could see my own mortality, but now. Now that I'm singing, my voice has just set me free. Groundbreaking research has shown that singing can help you. Ba, ba, ba. Reduces stress and puts oxygen into your blood. Ba, ba, ba. Helps your well-being. <laughs> if laughter's the best medicine, singing is almost as good. My, my, my emphysema makes my phlegm so much much greener so before we can't sing anymore raise your voice to the heavens and let's give the angels what for but 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 it's a really long musical bit at that point ah it's not over yet hold on it's got another 10 minutes i sound like mutley <laughs> when i ring my poor mom it sounds like a dirty phone call my 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 emphysema the air was one so much cleaner so before we can't sing anymore raise your voice to the heavens because that's what your lungs are there for raise your voice to the heavens because that's what your lungs are there for there you go yeah. that oh, was so that is the fault of ccg yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Do you need to catch your breath after that? <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I like the way that quite looking through the, the, the chat bar, quite a lot of the feedback is coming to me in GIFs, which I'm going to interpret later on. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, we've got we've got very clever at the, using the GIFs during the course of the week. So um, I, can't, I don't think we've had any questions in the chat, apart from one I asked earlier on, actually, in terms of, you talked about mental health patients um, not having their voice heard. Yeah. And um, and I I suppose the question was, are there other, other other are there any other patient groups that actually don't have their voice heard? But I suppose I'm, I'm what am I trying to ask you? Why is it that humour? What is it about humour that allows people's voices to be heard? Oh, such a great question, isn't it? You know, and I can only conjecture as to the answer. You know, I suppose there's no sort of definitive reasons. I suppose there's something about the irreverence of it. So if you think of any joke, all it does really, I think particularly jokes that we might not find particularly tasteful or whatever, as all those jokes do really, is they just go, let's think about this in a, di in a different way. You know, let's think about this subject in a different way. Um, and so I think when you're talking about things like so social deprivation or mental illness or like, uh, you know, or, or, or physical, you know, really serious issues um i think if you can talk about serious things in a humorous way it enables people to look at that issue 
differently as well. There's something about... It's really, I think the best example I can give, it's, all, it's like it was a couple of days after the 7-7, seven, seven, this has nothing to do with mental health, but it's about how humour can actually makes it easier to talk about things in a way I, I think so so and it was we the, the double act we did the comedy store the 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 two days after the seven seven bombings in 2005 um and so you know it's biggest comedy gig in london it's the it's the two days after london got bombed it's, it, it's only two thirds full and if you remember 2012 London had we'd been partying all night because we'd got the 2012 Olympics and everyone's convinced it was going to go to Paris. And um, and Roger Monkhouse, no relation to Bob Monkhouse, was comparing the comedy store that Saturday. We were on first. Really tense atmosphere in the room because London's just been bombed. Everyone's thinking about it. So as a comic, Roger has to talk about it. But obviously it's a really serious subject. And he just got on stage and went, yeah. The quite sore losers to French, aren't they? You know, and it was that it was that sort of whimsy thing that's not hilarious, but it's a whimsy, and the room erupted. You know, and so this is a bloke talking about an act of terrorism, but making a joke about it to the people who've just been bombed and totally getting away with it. And so I think humour is empowering, and I think that's what it is. I think the fact if you're using humour, you're automatically doing something that's inventive. Because you're looking at a thing in a different way, you, mm -hmm. you, just, you, you know, you're just inverting the way it's seen or, or whatever. This is why a lot of the jokes are about just changing roles, you, you know. So you might have a, uh, someone at the start of a sketch, at the sketch, you see that one person's a nurse, the other is a patient. By the end of it, you find out that they're, they're totally different. So humour will play with your expectations and confound your expectations. And what a joke does, even a two line joke, will tell a story but the end of the story will be a surprise. And that's how humour works. You've got a combination of surprise and misfortune. So, yeah, and I think and I think it's entertaining as well. So people are happier listening to jokes, I think, than they are to serious points. So again, comedy aside, we can go on stage and make loads of points about things about their care that people aren't happy with. But because they're, t they're telling jokes and making people laugh, the act of complaining actually makes you happier. So I think people like listening to comedy. And people like making people laugh and say, yeah, you can't do this. Yeah. And, it, and it, I guess it just feels so um, supportive from a well-being perspective. And we have conversate, we've we've had a few conversations during the course of this festival mm -hmm. in terms of how we use humour to support us and cope with us in terms of looking after ourselves and looking after each other. And as, as you will well know, cohorts of staff, whether it's health staff, social staff, the military, they, they all have, they call it the dark humour, but they all have their own way of dealing with with things that um, to an outsider might look very irrelevant or irreverent even, sorry. Yeah, and I think, I think it's the same with service users as well, you know, with people who find themselves on the receiving end of treatment. You know, some going back to the patient smoking, some of the jokes you'd hear in there, you know, it'd be, you'd have a patient go, I'm sure his pupils dilate when he increases my medication or, or things like that. Do, do, do you know what I mean? And it is that sort of shared humour, isn't it? Of, uh, yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or when you've got a shared experience, particularly, particularly, particularly if it's a difficult experience, humour is a great way of coming to terms with it. Yeah, certainly performing the Alzheimer's Who Done It, the murder mystery dementia show I've got, you get a lot of people who, who've got lived experience of dementia. And, and the feedback you hear most often is that it's really nice to hear jokes about it, you know, because there's, there's nothing hateful about them. And, and people say that, yeah, when it was my mum or my husband, they did these things and we laughed and it was OK, you know. Um, and, and so it's, it's about that nuance of laughter, isn't it, and where that laughter is coming from. And I think I think if, you, if your laughter is coming from a place of a big heart, you can't really miss. Yeah. No, no. And actually, Karen in the chat has just reflected um, this topic is a little off topic, but singing is so good for mental health. And can we bring this more into our dementia patients, oh, and yeah. also the mental health wards? Yeah. You know, she's working in a hospice. There's, um, it's tricky. So I, do, I often do the group poem in dementia settings as well. Yeah, you get it's, it's some of the dementia settings can be some of the easiest place in the world to get a sing along going. I, I think you know because there's there's certain songs and poems, things like the owl and the pussycat as well that are totally like hardwired. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's quite nice the way that you watch people come alive when a bit of music happens or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, good. And and Karen's just reflected uh, people rem reminisce around the bedside hosp hospice patients yeah. and laugh. And it's so lovely to hear laughter at a very painful time for them. 
Yeah. One of, yeah. One of, uh, there's a great comedy album, one of Bill Hicks's albums, Rantin E Minor. It's an album he recorded when he knew he was dying of pancreatic cancer. And as, as albums of stand-up comedy go, it's really unusual because it's, it's live comedy re recorded by a bloke who knew he was dying. Uh, yeah, it's one of the funniest albums I've, I've got, I think. OK. <laughs> I, and I have to say, I'm I'm definitely going to have to sign up for the uh, comedy asylum and uh, the um, the care home or brothel. I just I need to hear <laughs> that. I need to hear that sketch. That just made me howl. But um, anyway, I'll hand hand back to Dawn. Thank you. I don't know about anyone else. But my face hurts from laughing and smiling throughout that. So thank you so much for that, Rob. It was brilliant. I'm just going to share a, a, a couple of slides now. I, I did want to say if anyone's been affected by Rob's session, <laughs> but actually, if, if anyone's been affected by any of the sessions throughout the week, this page just gives you um, some contact details for the different types of support that are available. So please feel free to use those. Um, also, feedback is a gift, so please share your feedback with us around what your thoughts are on the World Virtual Wellbeing Festival. You've got to be in it to win it, and there is a prize draw. Once you uh, submit your feedback, you can get a year subscription to the Happy News, so just use the QR code. There are more resources as well on the Virtual Wellbeing website. Um, so just go to the link or the QR code and you can see what resources are there for you. And then um, I can't believe it is Thursday already. Tomorrow is our, our final day of the Wellbeing Festival this week. But there's loads of stuff. It's all been recorded. So you can find it all on the Wellbeing Festival website if you do want to catch up or anything else. Um, and just use the QR code to take you there as well. And I just want to finally say, um, get down with the kids. I think Dave always says that. Let's get down with the kids, get social, get on social media, um, share your thoughts with us on your on the Wellbeing Festival, how it's been for you, using the hashtag VWBF22. And then just want to say thank you so much, Rob, again, for making us all smile on a Thursday afternoon. Much well, thank needed. You. And, and, and thank you for having me. I'll just I'll just put my website on the, the old chat. So if any of you want to drop me a line, and say hi, find out any more about the whole thorny quagmire of, <laughs> of humour and healthcare. And all anyone wants, wants to send Rob a poem? Yeah, get it get it written. Lots of nicky. Yeah. Thank you so much, and thank you to everyone for joining as well, and thank you to everyone behind the scenes for supporting today. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday.